To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the first and the last who is dead and has come to life says this, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich, and the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison, so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. Now the modern city of Izmir sits where Smyrna used to be. Smyrna was one of the most beautiful places to live in even back then. It was a port city with fierce rivalry to Ephesus, which was 40 miles by 65 kilometers to the south. Smyrna was a modern planned city. It was one of the first cities in the world to have certain amenities like running hot water. It was known for fine architecture, flowers, fragrance, and wine. Now Jesus starts talking to this church and he says to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the first and the last who was dead and has come to life says this. This is the revelation of himself that Jesus brings to this church, the one who was dead and has come back to life. Now Smyrna was known as a city that rose up from its ashes. Once upon a time the Persians ruled Smyrna and they built a road 1,600 miles long all the way from Susa to Smyrna. Later on, the Babylonians took over the Persians, but the Babylonians weren't too much focused on Smyrna because they were focused on Greece. About 600 BC, a Lydian king conquered and destroyed the city completely. And then later on, around 300 BC, Alexander the Great, he came up and he rebuilt the city. So the people in the town, the children and everybody, they would have heard folklores and songs about how once upon a time the city was destroyed and then it was rebuilt. How once upon a time this city was dead and now it has come back to life. Now see the symbolism that Jesus uses here. He says, I was once dead. Now I have come back to life. I am the one who conquered death by resurrection. In verse 9 he says, I know your tribulation, your poverty, but you are rich. And the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Smyrna was home to many different pagan gods and religions. Many different deities like Zeus, the god of sky, lightning and thunder, or Apollo, his son, who was known as the god of medicine or healing, and other goddesses like Sibylle or Nemesis and Aphrodite, they would have all been worshipped here. Uh, Smyrna was also known for emperor worship. It was one of the first cities to start worshipping the emperor. And so the local citizens were required to take part in the activities in the temples built for the emperors. So for a Christian or for a church, in the midst of such uh, paganism, you can imagine the persecution that it would have attracted. They would have lost rights to their land or to their houses. They would have been denied jobs. Many times they would have even gone hungry without food. They would have died of starvation. As a Christian, to hear the words of Jesus saying, you may think that you're poor, but you're actually rich. That means so much more. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus says, I know that you are poor, but you are really rich. Store up treasures in heaven, where moth and rust won't get to it. And in the next part of the verse, Jesus says, And the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not. Now see, I think there were Jews there in that town, but they were not acting like Jews. They were not standing up for the faith and defending the cause of Yahweh. They were not promoting the works of God. What was happening was, like we mentioned, if you become a Christian or if you don't acknowledge Caesar as God or if you don't bow down to these pagan idols, you may lose a lot of things. Like you won't, be even, you won't even be able to go to the market to buy some things without acknowledging Caesar as God. So these people, if they would associate themselves with Christians or even be friends with them, they are kind of giving an impression that they're okay with what they believe. So what they did was they started spreading slander, blasphemy against the Christians saying that these people get together in their small groups, these people get together and they have sexual orgies, or the worst one, that they are cannibals, that they eat human flesh. Why? Because when they take part in the breaking of bread, the communion, they said, this is the body of Christ that's broken for you. This is the blood that's shed for you, which they considered cannibalism. We see a little bit of this in the early chapters of Acts.
attacks. That's why Paul was going, Saul was going around be, breathing threats against the people who followed the way. So there was poverty and then there was slander. And now in verse 10, Jesus says, Do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for 10 days. Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. Now he mentions persecution chat verse 9 and also in verse 10. Someone said there are two universal languages, music and pain. Every one of us could relate to pain. Now this tribulation that Jesus talks about here is not the great tribulation. The great tribulation will come later on in the book, okay? This is just talking about the persecution or the torture that these Christians in Smyrna were to suffer. One of the forms of torture that they would go through is what they would do is they would lay the victim down on a bed of spikes and they would start stacking weights upon them, weight upon weight, until the person was crushed and they died of pain and suffocation. So now these people already have weight stacked on them, poverty, dying of starvation, then they slander the people who are not acting like they should. And on top of that, Jesus is saying there's tribulation coming. And he used the metaphor here. He says for 10 days. Now, I think that it's just a figure of speech. It doesn't really mean 10 days or 10 time periods or anything like that. But he says, endure through it. And I will give you the crown of life. See, there is no, there is no glory without suffering the cross. Even Jesus had to go through it. And he said, if anyone is to follow me, pick up your cross. Without the cross, we cannot expect to get to the other side. Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. See, Smyrna held exclusive rights to the import and export of myrrh. Myrrh was used in the burial process of dead people. So they would have exported it to Egypt for the embalming process of the dead people. And Jesus, right before he was buried, they would have embalmed him in myrrh as well. Fragrance was produced by crushing myrrh. In other words, Jesus is saying, until you get crushed. See the metaphor here? Until you get crushed, you don't produce the fragrance. So Jesus is saying, I will give you the crown of life. Now, crown was a symbol of Smyrna. Remember, it was the crown city of Asia. In Greek, there are two words that they use for crown. One is diadema, which is kind of like the crown with, with the gems that the queen or the royalty would wear. And the other one is the stephanos, which is mostly made out of olive branches that would be given to somebody who won in a sport like gladiators or chariot races or even civil servants who had achieved something great. Now John here uses the word Stephanos. Remember Paul when writing to Timothy, he said, I have run the race. I have kept my faith. Now the Lord, the righteous judge, will grant me the crown of righteousness. That's what we all need to look for. God is saying, Jesus is saying, I will give you the Stephanos, the crown of life. In James 1.12, it says, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, but once he's been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. James was the first letter that was being circulated among the Christians. They would have read this before they read the Gospels. So this was one of the first Beatitudes they would have read. And so now years later, when Jesus says the same words, I will give you the crown of life, think of how much that would have meant to them. I will give you the crown of life. You may be going through a situation like Smyrna, whether you're persecuted for your faith or you're persecuted in other ways. Stand up for God. God says to him who overcomes, I will give the crown of life. What we're going through in this world today is temporal. This will pass away. But someday soon, we will be sharing eternity with him in heaven. He finishes the letter by saying, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. See, persecution refines us. Each one of us will go through the first death. But the second death, the eternity, that talks about in Revelation chapter 20, the white throne, that's what God is saying here. If you stand through this one, I will give you eternal life. You will not be hurt by the second death. So stand firm in whatever you're going through today. God has not abandoned you. He's still a faithful God. I'll see you next time. Oh,